Hello everyone, welcome to the Psychopharmacology Institute. We are back with another episode of Expert Consultations, where we interview elite faculty about clinically relevant topics related to psychopharmacology. I am your host, Dr. Radwa Hanafi, and today our topic is psychodynamic psychopharmacology. I would like to introduce our expert for today's discussion, Dr. David Mentz. Dr. Mentz is the director of the psychiatric education and a team leader at the Austin Riggs Center in Massachusetts. He is also a former leader of the Psychotherapy Caucus of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Mentz, it's wonderful having you with us today. That's great to be with you as well. Let's start by talking about the foundation of psychodynamic psychopharmacology. Could you please share with our listeners why psychodynamic psychopharmacology was founded and how it can help manage patients with mental illness? Sure. So the context is that I'm working at the Austin Riggs Center, which is the last of its kind psychodynamic hospital focusing on work with treatment-resistant patients. And I think very early on in my work here, it became apparent that at least a significant part of the treatment resistance that I was facing had to do with psychological resistances in patients, you know, whether it was ambivalence about the medications or secondary gains or different things. And so I started to understand that to really deal with the treatment resistance in these patients, it required attention, not just to the biomedical level of treatment, but really a lot of focus on what is it in the patient that is in the way of their making optimal benefit from the treatments that we have. So would you say that psychodynamic psychopharmacology is a concept that can be applied to all patient populations and mental diagnoses? For sure. At least most of the principles of psychodynamic psychopharmacology are applicable across psychiatric diagnoses. And actually, a lot of the principles that I've used found their origin in the writings of Michael Ballant, who used to do this work in the 50s with treatment refractory medical patients. So which psychotherapeutic skills would most benefit a psychiatrist in managing patients' medications? And how can clinicians effectively integrate such skills into brief medication management sessions to enhance patient care? Identification of ambivalence would be one. And that would include not just our listening skills, but the ways that we listen to behavior as communication. So a patient agrees to a medication change, but you see that their foot starts jiggling and that might cue you into the fact that you should have a discussion with the patient about ways that they might feel ambivalent about the thing you just decided. I think our skills for our attention to development. As a psychotherapist, we're trying to help people get where they're trying to get, whereas from a pharmacotherapy perspective, sometimes we're narrowly focused on symptom reduction. But I think to the extent that we can link the use of pharmacotherapy to the patient's overall developmental aims, to their hopes for themselves. We enhance the alliance and we can prescribe in a way that I think can avoid some of the traps where medications are used in ways that maybe help patients feel better, but don't help patients get better. I think as psychiatrists who've learned psychotherapy, we also can use those skills around enhancing the alliance. I think that another set of psychotherapeutic skills would involve our own ability to attend to our own process, because as much as we think of pharmacotherapy as kind of simple and straightforward, when we are working with complex patients, our prescribing may become shaped by our own countertransference. And so as therapists, of course, we learn how to attend to that and try to manage it. And lastly, I would say our skills for formulating, for stepping back and thinking What are the dynamics in this case that may be potentially in the way of the patient's healthy use of medications? Interesting. So I wonder if educating the patient about the limits of medications may add to the patient's ambivalence about treatment. My experience has not been that. I think patients are ambivalent. Certainly, if you're operating from a psychodynamic perspective, I think you understand that people are ambivalent about almost everything all the time. And I think medications are particularly so. I think that is highlighting the ambivalence does not increase it. Highlighting the ambivalence moves it out of the kind of an unconscious place and into a conscious place where it can be talked about and contained as opposed to just left to being acted out. I wonder when is ambivalence mostly seen during the management plan and what are the factors that may increase patients' ambivalence during treatment process? I think basically pretty much every patient has some degree of ambivalence about medications because well, I don't want to take medications. You all don't want to take medications. And so people are taking them not because they want to, but because they have to. Patients may also be quite ambivalent about treaters being in the hands of somebody because they've had very negative experiences with caregiving. 
for many patients, their diagnosis seems to be part of their core identity. Do you have any tips on how we can help patients build a strong identity separate from their diagnosis? When patients become attached to an illness identity, chances are that there is a real benefit to them in that that they experience, and that benefit probably relates to other negative experiences they've had. So I can say for sure that among a patient population of treatment-resistant patients that I treat, so many of them are actually far more powerful in a way as sick people than they ever were as well people. So that's the starting place, just to recognize that there is something in it for the patient. And then you start to understand a little bit more about what the dynamic is. And again, when a patient is doing something, when they're ambivalent, when they're holding on to an illness, the starting place is you've got to be empathic about that. You've got to understand that that's important to the patient. It is doing things for the patient. If you're not coming at that from an empathic position, the patient is just going to feel blamed and judged and become more resistant. Perfect. Sometimes like the countertransference within the physician may induce some guilt and may discourage them from working with certain patients. What would you advise clinicians in such cases? I think from a psychodynamic perspective, one of the things that we understand is that countertransference is also a path to empathy. You know, when you're sitting with a patient and you're like, why am I feeling so angry or why am I feeling so helpless? You know, one of the things that I will very typically find myself realizing, like if I'm feeling angry, is that, oh my God, I'm having a hard time bearing this feeling even for a half hour. This is a feeling that my patient struggles with probably all the time. And so I think you can use your countertransference in a way to actually restore yourself to a more empathic working alliance. We have to keep in mind that we do have the potential to use medications or pharmacotherapy defensively. We do have the potential to be driven by irrationality in our medication decisions in a way that helps us not so easily be carried away by our own irrational stuff. So to recognize that, you know, when a patient makes us feel helpless, you know, we may kick into a kind of heroic prescribing to try to avoid that feeling of helplessness that then leaves those patients with very complicated medication regimens or that we may give up or we may do all sorts of things that interfere with the patients you know, getting a good medication regimen. And so, yeah, just from a psychodynamic perspective, just being aware of our own potential for irrationality helps to contain it. Perfect. Patients sometimes attribute symptoms or behaviors to their medication, even when they are likely unrelated. Let's say a patient with chronic self-injurious behavior who cuts themselves and blames their fluoxetine. Do you think it is essential that we challenge these connections, or could that have a harmful effect on the therapeutic alliance? You know, you talk about challenging, and I might put it in a slightly different way. I think we need to be careful, or at least I feel like I need to be careful not to act as if I am the one that knows the truth and the patient is the one who has cognitive distortions, because I don't think any of us can really be in that position of knowing what's true. So when I'm going to challenge it, it's going to be more from a position of raising questions rather than acting as if I know what's what. Interesting. So this was such a rich discussion. Would you please provide our listeners with the main take-home messages from our discussion? Sure. Well, the first thing is to recognize that medication effects, and there's a very well-established evidence base for this, medication effects are profoundly affected by a range of psychological and social factors. And this evidence base, I think, is so important. And in many cases, actually, with antidepressants in particular, and I think anxiolytics, the evidence suggests that these psychosocial factors are actually more potent than the actual medications themselves. And so when we are ignoring those evidence bases that give us guidance, not just in what to prescribe, but in how to prescribe, I think we could argue that we're not actually practicing evidence-based psychiatry if we're ignoring those evidence bases. I think the second take home would be that as psychiatrists, particularly who've been trained, not just in pharmacotherapy, but psychotherapy, we have skills for addressing those psychological and interpersonal interferences in the healthy use of pharmacotherapy. And that includes addressing patients' ambivalence. That includes identifying the kinds of transferences that interfere with the patients being able either to use medications or to use us. And that using those skills can lead to stronger alliances and better outcomes. And lastly, that from a psychodynamic perspective, 
everybody in that doctor-patient relationship is capable of irrationality. So we also need to be attending to our own feelings and trying to figure out how to use them for the benefit of the treatment as opposed to allowing them to get in the way of it. This has been great. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Psychopharmacology Institute's Expert Consultations. Stay tuned for more and goodbye.